have a listener. Now, if I know anything about people like you, and trust me, I have a fairly good understanding, you do not know much about life among monsters and under gods. Never fear, dear listener, for I can be your guide through this tumultuous journey into our troublesome world. That is, if you're bold enough to accompany me. You see, if you truly want to know the fates of our beloved heroes, you must brave the murkiest of waters, the darkest of forests, and the sweetest of shops. Does that worry you? It probably should. But if you're still listening, welcome to Roanoke. Our favorite plucky heroine, you know the one, stands behind the counter, watching the half-filled shop of patrons. Her manager is fiddling with one of the machines. He wears many hats in this establishment, and today he's wearing a faded bandana to keep their hair back. It's a mechanic type of day. Edith, what flavor's coming out of the soft-serve machine? Uh, gray? What the hell? It's supposed to be strawberry! It's a really appetizing gray. I didn't hire you for your optimism, Edith. There should be a part for this at Dairy's Auto, and since you're doing great up here, you're in charge. Does this mean I get a raise? Edith, you're killing it. Love the entrepreneurial spirit. I'll be back in an hour. The manager dashes out of the store, flicking Edith's reservations a wave on his way out. Well, this seems pretty typical. This is Edith's fourth shift at the shop, fifth day in town. She'd be hard-pressed to say she enjoyed her job, but since the last attempt she made at joining the community ended on the wrong end of a baseball bat, it seemed the easiest way to pass the time in public. Unfortunately, it also gave her time to think. Too much time, really. There's only so much a girl can think about before her thoughts wander back to the mystery that became impossible once the daylight hit it. It didn't help that she had no one to bounce ideas off of. Good afternoon. Afternoon. What can I get you? Just a little soft serve cone. I have to say, I know everyone in this town, but I've never met you. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, staying with my aunt for the summer. You must be Linda's niece. Yes, I remember now. I thought you looked familiar. Right. Mayor Daly, pleased to make your acquaintance. Linda is a dear friend of mine. So I hope you enjoy your time here in Roanoke. Well, that's nice. Here's your ice cream. That'll be... Listen, Sprinkles, we gotta talk about what happened. The sweet shop has gone quiet at the scene. The sudden appearance of everyone's favorite nuisance and puzzle has become the center of attention. Mayor Daly's eyebrows have joined together, mouth tugging into a frown. Edith is blinking rapidly at the boy in front of her, wondering what she ever did to deserve this. The patrons are whispering amongst each other. Oh, and Bentley is also sopping wet. I... You... Why? Something's not adding up, and I don't like it. And I haven't exactly done this with anyone else before. Edith, for her part, manages to mask the murderous look on her face about 75% of the way. Bentley finally takes in his surroundings, and as he turns his head, beads of water flick onto the mayor's jacket. Hey, Mayor Dally, what's up? Hello, Bentley. I'm sorry, Bentley, but you'll have to wait in line while I work with this customer. Really, Sprinkles? 
Bentley, I get off shift in an hour. We'll talk then, okay? I get the feeling I'm the only one who gets your horrible customer service around these parts. Fine, not like you've been ignoring me these past few days. Bentley storms off, footsteps squelching against the ground, muting the anger he is trying to exude. Edith blinks once, twice, before turning her attention back to the mayor, who winces like she's bitten into a freezing bite of lemon ice cream. Your ice cream will be 432. I see you've met our best and brightest. Something quick passes over Edith's face, a mix between the shock after being slapped and a snarl before an attack. Something stirs in her, the feeling of knowing how others talk about you behind your back. And as much as she hates that part of her, she feels a kinship in it now. Her mouth opens to fight back, but then she remembers. This is a new start. And as much as some part of her is willing to fight for an outcast, she doubts Bentley will even care. The two of them were so... different. So Edith twists her mouth into a smile, lets out a little laugh, and nods, even while her skin crawls. Welcome back to another day in Roanoke, Edith Raleigh. I hope you're beginning to understand. Well, the rain's let up a bit since this morning, I think. She stares out from under the sweet shop awning, a faded pastel pink in a sea of dripping gray. A shiver runs down her spine at the dreary summer weather. Edith's fingers flex on her bike handles, the seconds ticking by as she watches. Waits. Finally driven you away, too. Beautiful day for a bike ride. The day is the same as any other of hers has been. She gets up to an empty house, prepares for work, goes to the sweet shop, bikes back to her aunt's house, still empty, and does very little else. A bit of hard thinking, some reading. A walk around the neighborhood if she's really feeling adventurous. This summer is cracking up to be everything she thought it would be. Pitiful, despite her hopes otherwise. But something in her will not be quelled today. A reminder of a promise spoken in the dark comes back to light, as it has so often in the past few days. Edith wants to figure out just what is going on in this town. Well, she better get going. So she misses the turnoff at Carmichael, as she has done so many times before, and she carries Haunt down the abandoned street. Here we are again, right where I left you. The house is in varying states of disrepair, yet underneath all of the ivy and mold and falling boards, its once grand facade makes a weak effort of being seen. It would be a good house, if it was properly cared for. Edith approaches through the grass, glancing around her. The forest is in the near distance. I'm really out here at the edge of town, aren't I? It's strange without walls. The closer she gets to the house, the more it seems to crumble before her. I can't imagine anyone still lives here, but... There wouldn't happen to be a doorbell, right? Edith has made her way to the front door of the house. A strange feeling descends upon her, settling on her shoulders and heart. It is cold, heavy, and yet somewhat familiar. Her heart beats faster as she recognizes it. She felt the same in the school a few nights ago. It is fear, but something else. Something she is not quite sure if it starts or ends with her. She casts another look around, but everything is the same as it has been. Edith grits her teeth and steps forward. What? She lifts her foot in shock, and underneath lies a torn welcome mat she missed. The elements have not been kind to it, with half of it missing and its once cheery colors faded with time and storms. All that can be made out is... Croat. Huh. I, I mean, kids break into houses all the time. This one is just asking for it. She reaches for the doorknob, bracing. Her hand lands on it, and whatever she expected, shock, freeze, burn, any number of human unpleasantry, 
does not arrive. Edith's grip becomes more certain, and her resolve returns as she twists the knob. Ah! It's just a house. Table, couch, stairs. More cobwebs than I like in a surefire inspection fail. But, well, Rally, what did you expect? She goes to take a step inside, just to further quiet the feeling of something larger than herself resting within her. But as her foot is about to cross the threshold, <coughs> the door slams shut. Not yet, Edith. We're not there yet. What the? It just... This is above my pay grade. She stands, looking back at the house, trying to figure out her next step. As much as the fear curling through her veins is begging her not to go back inside, she needs to. She needs to know what is inside, drawn to it. That house is important, an outsider in this town, so close to the edge of it all, but still hanging on. But it does not want her inside. So, she compromises. Ugh. Fine. Be like that, Crote House. I'll be back later. She walks backwards, giving it a stare down. A lesser house would groan on its foundations from such a withering glance. Edith finally gathers up her bike, and with a kick she is back off in the rain, in search of answers. Here's one, free of charge. It is not just a house. And it seems I have cursed myself because the rain is once again not good. I guess I should just head home in this weather. Come up with a solid plan. <gasps> Maybe make some hot cocoa. Hmm. Yeah, I like that plan. Sprinkles! Just go home, Edith. You can't hear it. It's just the wind. Sprinkles! I mean, it's not even my name, so I don't have to respond to it. Edith! What? Where were you going? I said I was going to be at the sweet shop. Bentley, my shift got off like half an hour ago. No, no, I could have sworn. Are, are you sure? Yes, Bentley. I know when my shift ends. Huh? T time is stupid. Mm-hmm. Well, are we doing this or not? What exactly are we doing? You're the one who burst into my place of work demanding we do something. <laughs> and you're the one who seemed so intent on unraveling every little strange thing. Don't pin this all on me. Oh, you just expected me to have a plan, didn't you? What? Do you not have a plan, Sprinkles? Edith opens her mouth to retort back, but the gears in her mind are already thinking. Bentley sees this and smirks but immediately remembers himself and puts on a scowl again. This town has to have a library, right? I already hate your plan. Your opinion is disqualified because you don't have a plan. But what are dusty old books gonna tell us about whatever the hell happened? Do you remember how the picture wall changed? Kinda of hard to forget, Sprinkles. It was pretty trippy. Well, I don't know the history of this town, but there could be something in the records that helps us. Ooh, sounds like a fun job for one person. I don't, I just go off and do, I don't know, literally anything else while you do the book stuff. <sighs> because I need you. You have a perspective I do not, and there's a good chance it'll provide insight we need. Nailed it. If you say so, Edith. Well, I do. Now, come on. I've been out in the rain enough today as it is. Wow. The library is not what Edith expected. Roanoke is quaint, exuding a certain rustic charm. Everything is neat and tidy, and while the library is no exception, it has a polish to it that gleams brighter than most of the town. The space our duo has just walked into is open, a lobby with different corridors leading out. Lush carpets pad their footsteps, and everything has a muted feel to it. <gasps> I appear to have forgotten myself. This is a library, after all. Brownstone walls are covered in shelves, 
and community bulletin boards advertising events. After the two quickly shake themselves dry, they exchange a glance. In the center of the space, pushed up against the wall, is a grand desk, raised ever so slightly above the floor. Edith senses authority and brings her own personality to it, spelling out fun for the rest of us. Excuse me? Oh, hello. You must be Edith. What? Oh, look who's disrespecting library rules. And Bentley, I haven't seen you here in a while. The mystery book discussion has been quite toned down without you. Edith mentally folding that away is almost audible. I'm sorry, but how do you know who I am? Well, I'm a librarian. It's my job to know things. And in a town like this, there is a lot to know. We were actually looking to know more about the town. Were you really? Yes. We were wondering if there was an archive or an exhibit of some sort about the town's history, or even some books, if you got them. I can assure you, we do have books, but I think the archive will be more appropriate for your search. The librarian walks out from behind the desk, leading the duo down one of the hallways. That's the thing with librarians. They're always just so helpful, never showing any regard for things like town funding or secrets that prefer the dark. The librarian leads Edith and Bentley down a hallway resembling a solarium. Glass on all sides, the weak, rainy daylight filtering through, the main road of the town is visible. Not a soul passes along, and for a moment, it seems that they are alone in the universe. Such a peculiar little thought. A human notion, certainly, to think one so separate. Here we are, the Rona Public Library Archives. We've been undergoing some renovations lately, which is why we haven't kept it open to the public. This floor is fine, so I do let people in on request. This floor? After the Historical Society, ahem, <laughs> burned down, unfortunately. I I'm sure you remember, Bentley, it was just this winter. Mayor Daly decided to allocate the society's funding to us, and we hold everything that was salvageable in the basement. We're still sorting through all of it, hence the remodeling. This room is what was already on exhibit. The exhibit room is smaller than one would expect, especially given the centuries of history inhabiting it. There are display cases lining the room with signs in front of them, guiding the visitor around the edges. A long table sits in the middle of the room, Maps and documents held under built-in lights. Clothing, taxidermied creatures, poor dears, and paintings fill the room. A dusty, distinctly history-esque smell pervading the air. Edith and Bentley enter the space, taking it all in. The lights are dim enough to be dramatic, but provide light to properly see. The librarian strides in, standing at the table. Here it is, young historians, the history of Roanoke from founding to present. So all the answers we could ever want are in here? Oh, well, I wouldn't say that. Answers can lie in places we least expect, and in the places that confound us the most. I'll leave you two to it. Was she purposefully trying to confuse us? Embrace it, Mr. Mystery. Now. How about a history lesson? <sighs> Librarians, am I right? Oh my god, I'm so bored, Sprinkles. Really, Bentley? So much old stuff, and I don't even know what I'm looking for. I've just been staring at that wall for the past minute. <sighs> you must be wonderful in group projects. But you're kind of right. A lot of this stuff is just what they teach even my colony about history. Let's look through these last documents, and then we'll figure something else out. But why? There might be something with a clue, or just something that stands out. You take this half, I'll take this one. <sighs> Edith shoots him a look before going through her stack. They're laminated and preserved, all yellowing papers and curling, nearly a legible script. They tell an oft-told and frankly dry story. Colin is to a new and strange land, cut off from the mother country. All who leave never return. 
dangers in the woods. All standard stuff. Edith has heard most of it before. And by the way, Bentley has slumped over the table, lightly banging his forehead against it. He's heard it too. There is a letter that gives Edith pause, though. Bentley, can you remind me as to who Richard Grenville is? Uh, oh, he's, uh, he was a bigwig in town history, one of, one of the founders, but he never made it over. No one knows what happened to him. Then can you make heads or tails of this? She passes him a yellowing paper. It's in rough condition, clearly forgotten and out of place. The writing is clear as day, though. I do not like where this is going. Dearest Richard Granville, I am feared this message may ne'er reach thee. It seems we have been calling into a void for months now. The nights have run longer and colder. Oh, for God's sake, give me that. There's a... It seems we've been calling into... Blah, 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 blah. Okay. This letter is mine own final hope to reach thee or the quietest of the world. I pray you, mine own love, send the tiger to the shoreth o' Roanoke. I fear this winter shall strike hard and long against all o' us. And it is o' oh, any motivation to make haste, let me tell thee this. Your son has taken ill. And there is still breath in thy breast. Send for us, and ensure the future o' thy newborn son. And I hear not from thee, then I shall accept that thou hast either turned thy back on us, or thou hast perished with all the quietest o' the known world. Hi, dearest, so thee might save thy son. Thine, Margaret Daly. The two are quiet, thinking it over. Bentley is trying to connect the dots over the history he knows. Edith recognizes that name, but also, the letter calls to something strange and dark, ringing a bell to the tune of the auditorium. He didn't make it back in time by the way. This envelope is addressed to England, and at the date it's postmarked, they were still sending ships out. Why is it here? Things changed. After the first few years, monster attacks got worse, ships were disappearing. If things were going to hell, then it explains why her son got sick, too. Huh. Well, we're not going to get the answers we need here. Oh my god, does this mean we get to leave? This room? Sure. I think... We need to go deeper. Are those the librarian's keys? Sprinkles, did you steal those? No need. The librarian left them here. Forgot, I guess. Huh. I'm not sure how many levels this place has, but if this is the ground floor and it only has the most basic narrative, the stuff that we might need would be lower. The next floor down is for storage, so unless you want holiday decorations and art supplies, we can just skip it. And if they just got a new collection they're still sorting through, it's probably going to be on the third floor. They're crazy about their archive. They wouldn't let esteemed Mayor Daly mess it up. Mystery book club. Bentley opens his mouth, but he can't dig up a scathing enough remark, so he plows ahead of Edith. The smirk fades off Edith's face. And pocketing the keys, she shuts the door behind them.